All right, it looks like we're just about all here. Should we begin? Yeah. Good morning. I'm State Representative Jonathan Steinberg from EBDB. Uh, and I'm here with my co-chair, Mary Doherty Abrams. We are about to initiate the uh, committee meeting of the Public Health Committee. We have three bills on today's agenda, but before we get to that, uh, I will uh, offer up an opportunity for my co-chair and the ranking members to uh, have any comments. Good morning, Senator Abrams. Good morning, Representative Steinberg. Good morning, everyone. Um, no opening comments. I think we should just get to work. Thanks. All business today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, uh, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ditto. I love the brevity of this group. We'll be out of here in 10 minutes. Uh, Senator Summers. I'm all set, thank you. Senator Wong. Let's get to work. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I love this committee. All right, we have three items on our agenda. The first up is Senate Bill 285, a raised bill an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. This is a JF to the floor. Do I have a motion? Representative so Pettit, so moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, you've all seen the bill summary on this, but I'm guessing maybe one or two of you wanna have a little conversation. So uh, would anybody like to come on this bill? Representative sure. Persiak. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to say that I'm against this bill. Like most of, or maybe all the nurses we've heard from, um, consistently when this bill comes up, the nurses are against it. We've heard many reasons why people are against it. I want to stick with just one. Um, and it's the financial reasons. There is no reason to do this except for money. One of the people testifying said it best when she explained how um, it costs a third less to employ a medical assistant than an LPN. And in Connecticut, we have no shortage of LPNs. We have schools, including a state school that educate LPNs. And what we do have are limited places that they're allowed to work. Now to, make, to take the econ economics of it and get, separate them from work seems particularly cruel. Um, no reason to do it. LPNs are there, they're, e they're, they're not hard to find. They're well-trained. It's another licensed nurse in the office, maybe the only licensed nurse in the office. Uh, so I do this on basically what in the labor movement we call a guild compute complaint. I want us to hold on to this work and not separate from the pure economic parts is this. People like their nurses. People like their interactions with nurses. People trust nurses in general as shown by polls year after year. One of the reasons they do that is because we establish a relationship with our patients, which we are able to do by spending time with them. We don't spend that time with them by doing only the jobs that can be done by a licensed nurse. We spend that time with them by doing the jobs that need to be done. With, and that includes giving, a, giving an injection, including a vaccine. Back to the economics of it, how the person explained it. I, I interpret it as once upon a time, a medical assistant was one third as expensive as an LPN. But that's, been, but that's been going on for long enough that now it's explained as an LPN costs 50% more than a medical assistant. We're the ones who are making this. I don't buy for a second that the cost of an injection, that the cost of the minutes time it takes to give an injection is what's making healthcare expensive. So please, to help nurses remain popular so that we don't become as unpopular as some other health professionals, 
let us define our profession. I don't know if there's another bill where every person who spoke in, against it was female, period. And that many of the people in favor of it were high paid administrators, not always female. Uh, many of the people, not all of them, I know. So that's my excuse. We don't need to do this. It doesn't move medicine forward. Um, gosh knows right now the governor's letting everybody with a high school diploma who thought they might be interested in something medical give an injection um, it, with his emergency powers. But someday he won't have those emergency powers. Or maybe someday we'll say, we don't think that veterinarians assistants should be giving people injections when it's not necessary that we reach to veterinary assistance. But for now, we don't need to be having medical assistants give injections. It's not necessary for them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I wanna thank you, Representative, for emphasizing the importance of relationships between practitioners and patients, something that is getting harder and harder in today's medicine. Though I wonder why MAs can't also establish relationships with patients, particularly if they're given the opportunity. But I guess the thing that I find difficult to understand is made a statement that the nurses should be able to define what they do. I kind of thought that was our job along with DPHs and that you have made it a kind of a guild issue, but should any guild be the sole determinant as to whether or not somebody else can do anything or should this be considered in a much broader context? Some should be able to, to uh, ha have a veto on who's able to do this. And many of the, the licenses, for instance, trade licenses that protect, that protect the scope of what their trade does, many of those, we allow those to go on, although sometimes there's fights. Can't the laborer do that instead of somebody who graduated from a trade school? But one thing that strikes me is those trades where we're comfortable and we don't even think about the fact that we are aware that they protect the, their range of practice and they protect their trade, those are generally male dominated trades. If we're gonna go after a whole class of workers, let's go after somebody else. And maybe we'll hesitate to do that because it's easier to see with other people. That, it, that, that we should listen to them and that we should understand that every minute of their job shouldn't have to be done by, by somebody who's able to achieve that level and not by somebody who's, it's their job, even though somebody else can do it. It'll never end. We went through years of having suggestions that we needed feeding aids. We need to be hiring people to just come in at mealtime and to be certified to do nothing else except for feed patients and convalescent homes. They will come up with some other way to save money if we kill this bill often enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I, I'll just say that, speaking personally, I do not see this in any way as a gender-related bill. Senator Kushner, followed by uh, Representative Berger Gervalo. Thank you, uh, Representative Steinberg and Chair of our committee. I um, want to say that I think this has been a difficult decision for me, I, uh, but I am concerned about uh, issues of corporatization of our medical profession and the delivery of care, and I have been consistently concerned about that. I did hear from independent practices and I uh, want to say that I hope our committee will consider ways we can help those independent practices and small practices to thrive because I think they are critical to care as well. However, I don't see this as the bill that, that really accomplishes that. I think finally, my main concern is that after hearing the testimony and a great deal of discussion that I found important and, and informative, uh, ultimately it came down to assurances that uh, medical assistance would not be, uh, and I don't know all the medical terms for this, but you know, deciding the dosage and and drawing the uh, you know drawing from the vials and all the things that concern people about making sure that folks are well trained to do that work 
it came down to all they were going to do is put the shot in the arm and ultimately and everything else would be done by others in the profession ultimately i didn't think that in itself was cost saving enough and could lead to abuse where uh, it would be hard to monitor practices and make sure that that was all that was happening and that was all that was being done so i you know for that reason i am concerned about this and and uh, have not been convinced that we need to do this at this time thank you senator representative burger travallo followed by representative pettit Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I actually, I've lost a lot of sleep over this one and I have spent the last few days speaking to as many nurses as would take my calls. And um, even this morning, I've actually spoken to another four nurses. Um, and uh, to be clear, each of these nurses, three of them Connecticut nurses, they um, insist that there is in fact an LPN shortage. Uh, they are experiencing it in their in the practices where they all work. Um, they would love to have more LPNs, but they know that they're harder to come by. So in lieu of that, this seems like a reasonable solution. Uh, they each used words like relief and blessing to be able to take some of this off of their workload. The other responsibilities that have been heaped upon them over the, the years um, it has them ways for looking to, looking for ways to actually get all of the things done in a day that they need to do. Um, and that includes patient care. Uh, so they all agree that this is a very simple task. And as long as truly there is a way for um, the doctor to be ultimately the one responsible for, um, for care, they are each in support of this. And I, I was looking. I, you, I was looking for, for someone to push back and I couldn't find one. Thank you, Representative <laughs> Maybe the nurses aren't monolithic. Uh, Representative Pettit, followed by Senator Summers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this is a straightforward bill that the medical community has been pushing for for many years. As we've heard, 48 other states allow this in some form or fashion. And I completely reject uh, someone who's gonna bring up the argument of their brother or sister jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge. That's a ridiculous kind of comparison. I would agree with the previous uh, uh, speaker that there is an inadequate supply of LPNs for these type of practices. LPNs can be paid much more money in other positions. We, in fact, you and a number of other people met with a number of private physicians virtually just at the end of last week and a pediatrician who had been in practice for 40 years suggests that it's a critical need that when they do have LPNs or RNs in the office, they want them to practice at the top of their training level and not spend most of their time giving the injections, which is essentially a procedure. We suffered through a lot of inaccurate testimony where people attempted to state that medical assistance would be somehow involved in decision-making about who was going to get a vaccine, doses and the like. And we know that that's completely fallacious. This is about the procedure giving the injection. And indeed, as you suggested, Mr. Chairman, medical assistants often have significant relationships with the patients that come to the office. I know my son does in his pediatrician's uh, office. Uh, the pediatricians are among the lowest paid physicians out there, perhaps only only outdone by the psychiatrists. So we, we tend to pay some of our most valuable physicians the least amount of money. I don't think this is about money at all. I think it's about efficiency in the office and allowing other people to practice at the top of their training. I think it's a straightforward bill that for some reason people have chosen to make a political football out of it. And I think 99% of the physician practices out there want this to go forward. And I think we should wholeheartedly support it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Senator Summers, followed by Representative Clarence Dietria. Uh, yes, most of my points have already been made, but I, I did want to just echo a few things that I want to remind everybody, this is only under a physician's direction. So if, if a physician is not comfortable, they will not give the authorization for that medical assistant to be able to simply do the procedure of the injection. They're not drawing the vial, they're not dosing, they are just injecting the medication or the vaccine. That's it. That's all they're doing. And if the if the physician is not comfortable, they will not allow them 
to proceed with that particular uh, part of their job description. Um, I would like to just let you know that I have um, been in contact with many private practices of which there are fewer and fewer every single day in the state of Connecticut. And one of the things that they have overwhelmingly said, whether it's a cardiology practice or a pediatrician is that having a medical assistant be able to administer a vaccine is critical. It will help them be more efficient and help them to be able to see more patients. And one physician in particular said, if I'm at one end seeing a patient and somebody needs a flu shot, I have to drop what I'm doing with my patient, walk down the hall, drop, get the vaccine and, and um, find my nurse who is really busy with paperwork, trying to get insurance coverage, trying to do things so that uh, people can get the tests that they need and have her stop what she's doing or he stop what he's doing and do the injection. So 48 other states have done this. This is, it's almost, you know, we've been asked about this for years and years. Um, I see no downside to this at all. And I will also remind folks that if a physician has a nurse in their office and they want the nurse to do the vaccines, they certainly can allow them to do the vaccines. It's, it's passive, there's an agreement. Um, the physician would be ultimately responsible should something go wrong with an injection. And I will also remind people, people can inject themselves. Women give themselves fertil fertility drugs on a week weekly basis when they're trying to go through fertility issues. We, we have um, pharmacists giving injections now. Um, so I think this is something that we can feel confident in doing. Again, it is the physician that would be ultimately responsible. And there is a true need. There is a very large shortage of LPNs. People tend to either go and get their full RN degree. There's, there's that uh, folks that they don't wanna just be an LPN, they wanna be able to do more. And that's something that hopefully we can look at in our recruitment bill that we will be having shortly, but I fully support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Great point. And we should really think a lot about recruitment and re retention of all critical specialty areas. Representative Claritis Dietria, followed by Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I fully support this bill. And this is a want that needs to be filled. The medical community has want, is wanted this bill for years. And this bill will help the the medical team work more efficiently together. The MDs, as we said, and APRNs will be responsible and will let the MAs have this responsibility if and only if they feel they're qualified to do so. So again, I, su I support this bill and I urge all my colleagues to vote for this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Miko, followed by Representative Dauphiné. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. So uh, I, I, uh, in, in the dialogue between yourself and uh, Representative Terziak, uh, Mr. Chair, there were a couple of issues that came up. One had to do with uh, male versus female, and the other had to do with uh, the uh, um, whether there was a monolithic position uh, with regards to this among the nursing community. So I, I'm looking at a piece of testimony that was submitted on this bill that I think uh, speaks to both of those. It was submitted by a a, a male nurse, and and uh, he uh, is questioning uh, the uh, the, the uh, validity of of this uh, of this uh, argument with regards to allowing the administration by medical assistance, and 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 he questions it based on based on assessments. So I, I'll just briefly read uh, an excerpt from what he had to say. Medical, uh, quote, medical assistants, although valued members of the healthcare team are not always trained to do assessments and to administer medications, nor does the state of Connecticut have the same oversight as it does over those it licenses. In addition, medical assistant certifications are not issued by the state and cannot be revoked by the state. Certifications in medical assisting come from one of four associations, each with different criteria and training requirements, unquote. If any one of those statements is true, it gives me pause about this uh, legislation. If all of those statements are true, it, uh, it, it solidifies my uh, vote uh, in opposition. So I just wanted to put that out for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Representative. Have you actually checked to see if any of those things are true? I leave it to the committee's consideration, Mr. Chair. Okay. Representative Dauphiné followed by Representative Pettit for the second time. Representative, you're still on mute. 
Representative Dauphiné, can you hear us? Sorry about that. I got my window went away and I was trying to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to share, make a few comments with regard to some of those that have been previ previously mentioned. And, and just like Rep. D'Amico mentioned that a license isn't given to a um, medical assistant, so it can't be revoked. Um, I get concerned with regard to um, the scope of giving out a medication, which includes um, other things other than just injecting a medication. It includes making sure you have the right dosage, the right patients, the right site, and so on. Um, and it, which, which leads me to the concern with liability. So the, I guess the, the, what was pointed out was that, that the nurse would only be giving an injection drawn up by the physician or um, another qualified individual and then injecting it. So I guess I wonder where that liability lies if the medical assistant then gives the wrong dose or the wrong site or et cetera. But I also wanted to just comment about the um, argument that 40 other states allow it, which I guess leads me to um, a little bit off topic, but we also are discussing taking away the medical, the religious exemption um, and nobody buys into the argument that 40, 45 other states are still allowing a religious exemption. And I just want to leave it there, but thank you for the time. Thank you. And to answer your, your, the, the first question with regard to liability, I believe that uh, because the MA or even the nurse is acting under the supervision and responsibility of the physician, the physician is liable. It's on their amount of practice insurance. And that's why physicians are likely to be quite discriminating as to which MAs they may allow to actually administer vaccines. Probably not some, may, some MA green out of school, uh, probably somebody who's got some experience. So to your point, the doctors are responsible. And if they're the ones recommending this, they must believe that they can uh, have MAs do so safely. Well, I think for that representative, I just wanted to point out that as a nurse in all of my nursing career, I would never ever draw up a medication or give somebody a medication and count on them giving it correctly or giving it to the right patient. I've worked in acute care in the hospital. I've worked at um, offices and camps, and I would never do that. I'm just saying, personally, that's how I feel. So I just want to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Pettit, I'm sorry, we're going to go to Senator Wong for the first time and then Representative Pettit for the second time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm always happy to follow uh, Representative Pettit. Uh, that being said, I, I do want to echo and compliment uh, Representative Berger Gervalo uh, because I also followed up with private practices nurses and community clinics. And uh, I think the, the overwhelming response was the workload burden to be eased by having a, a member of their trusted team help in, in offloading the, 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 the workload and the pressure. Um, so I, I appreciated her diligence in sharing that with the committee. I, I think the, the other component that, that sways me to be very supportive of this bill is you are always going to have the oversight of a medical professional. Um, and ultimately, for me, in, in, in this environment, we want to increase access and efficiency. And, and it's not just in private practices. It's also in our community clinics that are providing critical care to people in the community. The, the less that um, they have to be bogged down by some of this, the more uh, accessibility and availability they have to provide other critical supportive medical services. So again, this is about increasing access and efficiency. And, and I appreciate the, the chairs for bringing up this bill and for us to have this conversation. And ultimately, um, I'm very supportive of it after talking to people out in the field um, and, and people that are providing these critical care. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Representative Pettit for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to follow up on some comments that have been made, it's clear that some people don't take the time to read the bill. This bill does not involve decision making. This bill does not state anything about drawing up doses. This is the administration of the vaccine, number one. And to follow up on your point, when we met with physicians from all over the state last week, to a person, they agreed that the buck stopped at their door, that the liability lay completely at the feet of the physicians who ran the office and was overseeing the MA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, uh, we can have a vote on the bill. 
Do, should we have a voice vote or would you prefer a roll call vote? We can do a voice vote unless anybody objects. I think you have to. I think we have oh, to have a roll JF, call you're vote right, you're right. on anything so, JF. Thank you for reminding me, Madam Co-Chair. So we will have a roll call vote. Madam Administrator, are we ready to begin the vote? Yes, we are. Then please proceed. Senator Dr. Abrams. Senator Darty Abrams votes yes. Representative Steinberg. Remember, you should have your, your cameras on and uh, be ready to vote. Representative Steinberg votes yes. Senator Anwar. Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner votes no. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Wong. Senator Tony Wong votes yes. Senator Summers. Senator Summers votes yes. Representative Pettit. Representative Pettit votes yes. Representative Arnone. Representative Arnone votes yes. Representative Berger Javallo. Representative Berger Javallo votes yes. Representative Betts. Representative Betts votes yes. Representative Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Representative Cook. Representative Dauphiné. Representative Dauphiné votes no. Representative D'Amico. Representative D'Amico votes no. Representative Elliott. Representative Foster. Rep Foster votes yes. Representative Django. Representative Django votes yes. Representative Green. Representative Green votes yes. Senator Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Senator Castle. Senator Castle votes yes. Senator Castle. Senator Kasser votes yes. Representative Cabros de Gras. Representative Cabros de Gras votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Representative Kennedy votes yes. Did you see me? Representative Claritas Dietria. Representative Claritas Dietria votes yes. Representative Lenahan. Representative Linehan votes no. Representative McCarty. Representative McCarty votes yes. Senator Moore. Senator Moore votes no. Representative Parker. Representative Parker votes yes. Representative Ryan. Representative Ryan votes no. Representative Scanlon. Representative Scanlon votes yes. Representative Terziak. Representative Terziak votes no. Representative Young. Representative Young votes yes. Representative Zupkis. Representative Zupkis votes yes. Senator Anwar. Representative Elliott. We're gonna leave the votes open, correct? Representative Steinberg? Yes, we are. Um, shall we say uh, 11 o'clock? Um, let's see when this meeting ends. Let's say an hour after the meeting ends. Can we do sounds that? Good. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, so we're gonna move on to item two of the agenda. Senate Bill 416, an act concerning various revisions to the Department of Developmental Services statutes. This is a JFS to the floor. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Just to remind you, this bill makes a number of changes to the DDS statutes. 
uh, uh, makes information on DDS's abuse and neglect registry available to the Department of Administrative Services to determine whether an applicant for employment with DDS, DCF, DEMAS, or DSS appears in the registry. Current law allows uh, these other agencies access to the registry for the same purpose. Section two, DDS regional or training uh, school director to consent to emergency medical treatment for an individual under their custody or control under the same conditions that already apply to emergency surgery. Among other things, the person attending physician must determine that the treatment is of an emergency nature and that there is insufficient time to obtain the written consent otherwise required. In other words, usually you'd have somebody who's responsible for them, a guardian of some sort, but in this case, it's an emergency. Section three, uh, in cases where there are reported uh, abuse warrants, um, investigation, this section removes the requirement for DDS to notify the person's legal representative and the representative has been found to be the substantiated perpetrator. Makes perfect sense, right? Section four, updates appointments to the uh, Camp Harkness Advisory Committee to reflect name changes for certain entities, pretty straightforward technical. Section five, as part of required probate court um, triennial guardianship assessment, the bill eliminates the requirement for a DDS assessment team to submit a written report on testimony if DDS determines that the individual does not have an intellectual disability and thus is ineligible for DDS services. It instead requires DDS to provide the court with a copy of the eligibility determination letter and specifies that the team is not required to further evaluate the individual. Again, uh, just following good process and recognizing the circumstances in these very difficult situation. Uh, do we have any comments? Great, if not, we're ready for the vote. Madam Administrator. Senator Darty Abrams. Senator Darty Abrams votes yes. Representative Steinberg. Representative Steinberg votes yes. Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner votes yes. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Wong. Senator Tony Huang votes yes. Senator Summers. Senator Summers votes yes. Representative Pettit. Representative Pettit votes yes. Representative Arnone. Representative Arnone votes yes. Representative Berger Gibalio. Representative Berger Gibalio votes yes. Representative Betts. Representative Whit Betts votes yes. Representative Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Representative Cook. Representative Dauphiné. Representative Dauphiné votes yes. Representative D'Amico. Representative D'Amico votes yes. Representative Elliott. Representative Elliott votes yes. Rep. Elliott votes yes. Thank you. Representative Foster. Representative Foster votes yes. Representative Django. Representative Django votes yes. Representative Django, can you turn your camera on, please? Oh, I'm sorry. There I Thank am. You. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Representative Green. Sorry, Representative Green votes yes. Senator Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Senator Castle. Senator Castle votes yes. Representative Cabros de Gras. Representative Cabros de Gras votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Representative Kennedy votes yes. Representative Claritas Dietria. Representative Claritas Dietria votes yes. Representative Linehan. Representative Linehan votes yes. 
Representative McCarthy? Representative McCarthy votes yes. Senator Moore? Senator Moore votes yes. Representative Parker? Representative Parker votes yes. Representative Ryan? Representative Ryan votes yes. Representative Scanlon? Representative Scanlon votes yes. Representative Terziak? Representative Terziak votes yes, thank you. Representative Young? Young votes yes. Representative Young? Representative Young votes yes. Representative Zopkis? Representative Zopkis votes yes. All righty then. Again, we're holding the votes open roughly an hour after the conclusion of our conversation today. We are up to the third and last bill on today's agenda, Senate Bill 835, an act concerning deceptive advertising practices of limited services pregnancy center. This is a JF to the floor. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Comments? I would guess some of you would like to say something. Representative Carpino followed by Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I understand that there are potentially two reasons for this bill. It's either A, to pick on certain folks with views that you may disagree with, or B, to prohibit women from being unfairly deceived. I will give everybody the benefit of the doubt because I truly believe and agree that no woman who is seeking services, particularly during a sensitive time, should ever be deceived. And I agree with that concept wholeheartedly. However, I think that the bill is flawed. And in order to solve what I believe are those flaws, LCO has been kind enough to help me draft three separate amendments to fix those flaws. I realize the difficulties in debating amendments here in this virtual platform. So I'm going to save those for the floor of the house where we can have a a lengthy and a um, hopefully positive discussion on how we can solve them. I will respectfully tell you that I believe that if we are truly trying to prevent women um, and their significant others who hopefully um, maybe in some instances part of this care from being deceived, then we need to apply these rules and these proposals to every center that provides any sort of pregnancy treatment. I also believe that we then need to apply the same rules to all of our medical providers, that nobody should be deceived or misled, whether intentionally or unintentionally, um, by assuming the care that may be provided by a medical provider. So I think we need to have a broader discussion if we're trying to make sure that our our residents are not deceived or misled or simply have a misunderstanding about the medical procedures that are provided. And finally, I do believe that CUPPA does, or at the very least, because Attorney Tong was kind enough to spend some time with us last year. Um, If it doesn't, it should apply. So while I will be a no today, I do think we need to have a broader conversation if we are truly trying to make sure that none of our constituents are misled in seeking medical services. So I thank you and the committee for your time. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I wanna thank you for your sensitivity on this difficult subject. And I will suggest to you there are a number of members of this caucus who sincerely believe this bill could be improved upon. And uh, I could virtually guarantee you uh, that we will, be able to convene an informal working group on a bipartisan basis to discuss the amendments that you're considering. And I'm sure there are probably some other ideas as well. Uh, I don't know how far afield we can necessarily get from where this bill is, but I think there's a sincere effort on both sides of the aisle to come up with something that's fair and reasonable and is not uh, overly burdensome on any particular group, but really protects the interests of uh, vulnerable, oppressional pregnant women. So uh, thank you for not only your sensitivity, but your willingness to work on this and your willingness to do so uh, after assuming we pass this bill out of committee. Thank you, sir. Representative Pettit followed by Senator Summers. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think any of the 33 members of this committee want deceptive advertising practices to occur for any service in, in this state. Uh, my objection from the start has really been that I feel that this is covered under current law through DCP, who can then ask for help from the Attorney General's office if they think it is, is necessary. I think it is indeed covered under CUPA after we had a testimony in the previous go through from the attorney who helped draft that statute. Uh, and I think our time, 12 or 14 or 16 hours we spent discussing this would have been better spent on issues related to mental health, suicide, telehealth, and things that have been issues during the, uh, the pandemic over the past year. So I, I don't see this as moving us forward dramatically and we're spending a lot of time on something. I don't think it's gonna material cha materially change uh, people's ability to make a complaint about uh, advertising or communication that they feel is uh, not honest. So I uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. And I wanna thank you for highlighting the coming attractions of this committee, which include behavioral mental health, suicide prevention, uh, uh, telehealth, opioids, nursing homes, uh, all those things are going to get addressed in hearings, and we will be advancing a number of things that are very much topical and of concern to all the citizens of our state. Senator Summers, followed by Representative Gilchrist. Yes, good morning. Um, I would like to echo um, really uh, Representative Carpino and some of the things that uh, Representative Pettit have um, spoken to this morning. This is the third year we've heard this bill, I believe. And we've heard, when you add up all the hours, you probably had 36 hours or plus of testimony on this bill. And when you look at those who testified, overwhelmingly the people that came here in front of our legislature were against this bill. The few people that were supportive of it, um, it's what I would call sort of recycled testimony. It's the same story that they uh, indicated about an incident in Hartford that happened years ago that uh, Hartford filed a lawsuit on and the lawsuit was withdrawn uh, because uh, they are not allowed to do the things that Hartford wanted to do. Um, I also you know, can't help but feel uh, that this is, it's really a uh, sort of a belief difference. Um, I don't think anybody here wants women to be deceived. I certainly don't. I am a person of choice. I want women to make the choices that they want, especially during a time of an unplanned pregnancy but we have not heard one case of anything being deceptive here. We have just not heard it in three years. We've heard anecdotal information about somebody coming and, and uh, going into a, a clinic and, and being intercepted by somebody who didn't feel the same way, but that's not deceptive. And I, I, I have always taken uh, exception to the name of this bill, deceptive advertising. And if you go, this bill is being pushed by a political organization. If you go to that political organization's website, it talk, it used to talk about deceptive pregnancy centers. Now it talks about fake health centers. And it talks about fake health centers trying to trick women entering the clinic, trying to manipulate them and dissuading them from considering abortion. That is not what we heard from the people testifying at all. And, and, and I think that the committee really needs to be careful because in years, there has been not one complaint against this, any preg pregnancy crisis center, just like there hasn't been any complaints against Planned Parenthood. And I think that we should be able to allow women to have the choices on either side of the aisle, wherever they lay, wherever their choices are in a, in a way that is fair. And, and this bill singles out those who don't agree with the political organization that is pushing this bill. And I will remind everyone that in California, there was a bill passed that forced uh, pregnancy crisis centers to advertise that the state offered free abortions and to notice that they were not medical providers. That was taken to the Supreme Court and it was shot down because the Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional and it prohibited from California from enacting that law. So we are gonna be faced in that same position here in the state of Connecticut. If there were issues at any of these pregnancy centers, people have a right to file complaints. It's covered by consumer protection, but there has not been one complaint in the state of Connecticut. So 
I would like to work on this bill to move it forward in a way that people on both sides can feel comfortable if that's what it, this is gonna uh, come to, but we don't have an issue here and we are spending time on a bill on something that is not a problem when we have many other things that this health committee really needs to address. And I um, have many, many amendments as does Christine Carpino. And I would like to work if there is this working group set up to try to make both sides feel comfortable that this is not happening without penalizing a group that whether you agree with what they do or they don't, they have helped over 30,000 women in the state of Connecticut at no cost to the state. They do this on their own dime. So I, I really think this bill needs to have a, a broader look. I think that the things that are requiring, I, I don't know any other industry that has the attorney general called out in the bill. This should be absolutely covered by CUPA and this absolutely should go through the process like every other healthcare provider does. We don't have the attorney general called in on hospitals and other clinics, only this one political issue. So I think that's something that everyone needs to keep in mind as we move forward. And, and that's why I will not be supporting the bill today. I hope that we do have a chance to work on this in a bipartisan uh, way moving forward. Um, but I see a lot of issues with this bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator. And I agree with you. Uh, I think we all acknowledge that uh, these organizations do good work. They support people, they show compassion. Uh, certainly not uh, my intention to attack them for the good work they do. We're talking about something that is a very narrow part. Uh, I will disagree with you that I, I thought I heard some testimony even this year that I found at the very least extremely misleading. And I'm not a lawyer, but uh, personally, I, I, I trust the attorney general to um, make a determination based on the evidence on whether or not there is cause to bring suit and the fact that the AG a couple of years ago testified saying he would appreciate having that authority suggests that he does not believe the CUPA adequately covers this gap in uh, the ability to uh, uh, deal with bad actors. Uh, if I can respond to that, please. the Attorney General did not bother to show up at this hearing either this time. And we've heard from the same people about the same incident in Hartford which then there was a lawsuit that the lawsuit was withdrawn. So, you know, I have a little different take on this. And, and um, I, I, you know, obviously if you're the attorney general, you want your hands in everything. That's just what you want. So this could absolutely be handled by CUPA. And if they need to, then they could bring the attorney general in. But again, this is one organization because of whatever the belief system may be different. And again, I'm a person of choice. I think women should have the choice to, to make their own decisions. Um, but we have a system now and there has not been one complaint. And, and I think that um, the attorney general can be brought in if need be, but this would be the only organization that we are citing in legislation that the attorney general has that power off the bat. And I think that that is a scary precedent to set for future for all healthcare organizations or you know volunteer organizations because there, there's such a broad term as far as what is considered deceptive, what you consider it, what legally can be considered, it's not defined in the bill. So that's my hesitation, but I'd love to work on it and I don't wanna take up more time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative Gilchrist followed by Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm in strong support of this legislation today. This bill is about ensuring that when women seek reproductive health care in the state of Connecticut, they aren't deceived in order to limit their choices. And we did hear a uh, testimony, one from um, a doctor in an area hospital, one from Hartford GYN, um, explaining their conversations with their patients who had been deceived at an area crisis pregnancy center. We also have um, information from a secret shopper report uh, that was done that gives example after example of deceptive advertising and deceptive statements. And I think the reason we haven't heard directly from women who have had this happen to them is because of the nature of seeking an abortion in our current climate and our current culture. Um, there's a lot of shame placed on women, a lot of blame placed on women. Uh, women are actually physically sometimes under attack when seeking an abortion in our state and in our country. And so to not have women come forward is not too surprising. 
We've also been given website illustrations of deceptive statements that are being used at crisis pregnancy centers. And during our public hearing, we heard testimony from the ABC Women's Center in Middletown about how they have something listed on their website called an abortion reversal. An abortion reversal is not a medical procedure. It is not recommended by um, leading medical organizations. And in fact, a study had to be cut short because three women started hemorrhaging from this procedure. And when pushed on the fact that the ABC Women's Center had this information on their website, their executive director defended having that information on there and defended using progesterone for off-label use, which was incredibly concerning, concerning. and problematic and to me is the very definition of deception. This bill says that it requires that no limited service pregnancy center, otherwise known as a crisis pregnancy center, make statements concerning any pregnancy related service or the provision of such service that is deceptive. Saying that abortion reversal is something that women can have done and recommending that women use progesterone for off-label use is deceptive and it's dangerous. And it's one of the very important reasons why we need to pass this legislation today. Since uh, people keep bringing up that we've heard this bill over and over, that is the process. Um, it was introduced in 2017, it's made it out of committee, it's gotten voted on on the floor of the house. After it got introduced in 2017, we began to see some of these crisis pregnancy centers change the way they advertise, which is a positive, but it also shows that a policy like this is needed. We also heard during the public hearing about the Connecticut Pregnancy Care Coalition that many of these crisis pregnancy centers belong to. That coalition was formed in 2017, again, after we first introduced legislation here in the Connecticut General Assembly. And it is my understanding from reporting on this Connecticut Pregnancy Care Coalition that they require their member centers to take a softer approach to crisis pregnancy help. But there are some crisis pregnancy centers in the state of Connecticut who will not participate in that coalition because they are not willing to sacrifice direct contact with women they find to be most effective in preventing abortions, which means they are gonna continue using deceptive statements unless we, pass this policy and put in these precautions. So to me, this legislation is about creating uniformity across the state and ensuring that regardless of the website that a woman visits or the crisis pregnancy center she walks into, she receives medically accurate information. And I would urge all of my colleagues to support this proposal today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Senator Wong, followed by Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and as a new member of the Public Health Committee, this was one of the very emotionally charged bill that I was very eager to, to sit through the testimony and, and, and learn from. And as the proponent of this bill and the title takes great effort to state, this is a bill about addressing deceptive advertising practices. Um, and, and I really want to echo the statements made by my esteemed ranking member, uh, Dr. Pettit, and, and also Representative Carpino, in recognizing that uh, this was one that they deliberated um, thoughtfully to. Three points comes up in my mind of thinking. Uh, I, I think the first one is, in, in no way is this looking to address the abortion decision-making issue. But I have always supported a woman's right to choose and, and about their body choice decisions and, and decisions about choice. Always have, always will. That being said, I, I believe we have skewed the decision or, or the dialogue away from abortion rights to a, a, a policy of an organization that my second point being is, is deeply faith-based. And, and also deeply involved in, in providing an alternative viewpoint. Um, and and I, I, I got the sense from the testimony and the, the exchange and the emotionality of it that there was a, a, a obviously a viewpoint for those that uh, supported this bill, the rationale, 
But I also saw a tremendous disdain from the tone of people who felt otherwise and opposed this bill. And, and I, I, I felt as though that uh, people's religious views, people's viewpoints, people's differing point of view about what may be the, the, the populist viewpoint was being derided. And, and, and I was deeply troubled by that. Um, and, and number three, I, I, I saw at the end of this whole solution, this debate was a solution looking for a problem. Um, and when you start kind of breaking down the analysis in, in talking to the Department of Consumer Protection that in five years, not one, not one formal complaint was made to that department. I might have gotten an incorrect error, but if I that is correct, my, my question to, to the, the, the committee is, are we looking to create a solution that could have possible chilling effects on, on religious faith and, and decision making um, and turn it into a politically charged issue? I would let others make that determination. But if that is indeed the case where in five years, there was no formal complaint filed. There may be a lot of innuendos. There may be a lot of secret shopper type of dynamics that was cited earlier, but not one formal complaint. And the one case that was cited over and over again that was initially presented by advocates of this bill, we found out much later through request and, 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 and information that it was indeed settled out of court where there was no, no decision made, no guilt found. Again, it, it, it seems to be that there might be a significant chilling effect for people whose opinions may be very, very different, very contrasting based upon their faith, based upon their personal viewpoints, um, that, that, um, that you're not following the, the norm and we don't like it. Um, I, I fear if that is indeed the case that we have the power of chilling effect over people's uh, independent thoughts and, and, and contrasting viewpoints that are different from what the popular stands are, that we can mute them, that we can turn them and, and have a specific targeted action, in this case, on a healthcare decision or religious-based decision to give an authority to the attorney general, which we've not done on medical health decision-making issues. Um, it, it really is a, a, an overstep. And it just seem to me as I'm evaluating this whole thing that we may be overstepping again and crossing the separation between church and state, uh, using our force of government to, to create chilling for effects on viewpoints that may be so very different than what may be the norm. So I, I will close by this. Um, I am encouraged by the chairman's comments that um, there are possibilities and improvements to this bill. And I hope that we will get a working group to have all parties involved to collaborate, to recognize that there could be uh, solutions, but ultimately the best consumer uh, support in, in these critically emotionally charged times of decision-making. Uh, so I, I hope this committee will give that opportunity for, for improvement and collaboration. And I wanna close by thanking Dr. Pettit for his uh, wise words and for the, 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 the proposed possible amendments that may be coming down the road that we may not have to call, maybe we can make this bill better. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity to share my perspective and viewpoint on a very controversial issue when it, it, it should maybe not be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Representative Foster followed by Representative Betts. I would like to echo, I think uh, Senator Huang puts it nicely that this is an issue that is con that maybe should not have to be controversial. As we went into this public hearing, I feel it's important to share that I really struggled with the idea that this was a target on faith-based organizations, that that was something that I spent a lot of time trouble tr troubled with personally, that someone would feel that way as I've spent most of my professional career um, and my whole life with my faith guiding benevolence in the work that I do, feeding the hungry. But this is that work aligns very closely with organizations that make sure children, infants are well cared for. Um, that being said, because we did in this public hearing in real time from the director of one of these centers, hear an example of 
a deception on a website that was counterindicative of current best medical guidance. And because we heard examples shared about how services provided by them were necessary to gain access to other services when we know based on our systems that that is not true and that services provided by them were um, promoted as being an ultrasound is necessary to gain access to services like Husky or WIC and that is not the case. Because those discussions happened in this public forum that this decision and vote in favor and support of this bill became an easier choice for me to make, even though it, it's something that I have struggled with a lot. And I do feel like I need to say and be very clear publicly before this vote takes place that I believe that faith-based nonprofits do incredibly important work and the motivation for your important work when you are a benevolent contributor to society should never be frowned upon. And I do believe and I hope that a lot of these centers will continue to do all of the good work that they're doing, making sure young infants have access to diapers and car seats and all of that work that is so incredibly important and meaningful in our society. And that um, the idea or that our, we've codified law or could end up codifying law that prevents deceptive practices shouldn't change anything about the way a faith-based organization practices because I'm certain none of them want to intentionally deceive because that wouldn't be aligned with their value system. And so, although I went into this public hearing feeling torn, knowing and seeing representation and discussion that was in fact deceptive, whether it was intentional or not, I think makes this vote very easy for me. Um, and I do reject my colleagues um, proposal that this is an intentional targeting of a faith-based organization because of differences in opinion. Because as a woman whose faith guided me to get into the work that I do, I think that you can believe in protecting folks from deceptive practices and still hold accountable people of faith to not be deceptive. And it has nothing to do with the faith. It has everything to do with being deceptive. And so I, I do look forward to talking about this with colleagues who have differing opinions to my own, because I think in the end, what comes down to the fact that we all seem to agree on that deception is a problem. Um, and I'm very eager to see what happens that comes next, but I will be voting in favor of this bill. And it is after a lot of, um, of, of thought and consideration. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Betts, followed by Representative Berger Gervalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start off by saying I think this is precisely not the role of the legislature to participate in a philosophical debate. Uh, there is no law, and anybody who knows me knows that law should be a very last resort. There is no law, in my opinion, that can be written that's going to ever create peace or find common ground uh, between these two groups. It's never going to happen, and it won't be enforced if it does happen. It's very clear that there is a system in place to hear complaints, whether it's about advertising or whatever. And for us to spend this amount of time, and this is my personal opinion, but I feel very strongly about this. There is nothing good that's gonna come from this, legis this proposal, but I really don't consider this to be up there in the top priority of items our committee should be taking a look at because they're so urgent, such as mental health, and suicide. To me, that's real, that's broad-based, and it's something that we really should be charged with doing, and I'm enormously disappointed that we have not taken that up, uh, particularly in place of something like this where we had such a long hearing, nothing new is really revealed, and if anybody says that you can get a solution by this proposal, I'm waiting for it, but I'll bet you a lot. There is no middle ground, but I think it's a disservice. We have some people who are really really hurting badly in the mental health system, which is badly broken and needs desperate revision. To put this in place of that, I think is a disservice to a lot of people who are looking for us for leadership and help. And there will be no outcome of a solution on this proposal. I promise you that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I just want to reiterate, so no one is confused. We have a bill on behavioral and mental health. We have a bill on suicide prevention. We have a bill on telehealth. 
We have a bill on opioids. We have a bill on nursing homes. This committee is not shirking its responsibilities. We're planning to talk about all those things. We are willing to consider a broad gamut of different conversation topics this session. Not everybody agrees with all of them, but we are not ignoring critical issues before the people of the state of Connecticut. I just want everybody in the public who's watching to understand that. We will have hearings on all those things. Representative Berger Gravalo, Gravalo followed by Representative Dauphiné. Thank you. Um, regarding the claim that keeps coming up that uh, there are no reports and therefore this is um, not worth having a discussion about. Um, after, after the hearing last week when I felt compelled to share my very personal experience um, regarding an unwanted pregnancy at a very young age, I was remarkably distressed following that hearing. And um, I reached out to my two closest friends, people who I've known for over 20 years. And both of these women, after 20 years, shared with me their own personal stories. We had never discussed this. We talk about absolutely everything else. We were not comfortable sharing this with one another until I reached out to them in a very vulnerable state, one that I'm kind of feeling like I'm in right now, to be completely honest. Um, I didn't tell these two women, they didn't tell me. And we discussed then, what would it have felt like if we had talked about this with a stranger? And the God's honest truth is we never would have. Um, so once again, I am laying out my truth in, um, in a way that makes me feel extremely vulnerable, even though I am not in any way ashamed or regretful about my decision. Um, but I'm risking my own comfort to express that not reporting this does not mean that it does not happen. It simply means that at 19, I wouldn't have reported this to anyone. And I think it is important to bear that in mind. And that is really all. And once again, I will reach out to my friends later for comfort. Thank you, Representative, for sharing that. Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Representative. And I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I know that Representative Gilchrist uh, and I think Rep Foster were both referring to the um, link that was on the page with regard to the progesterone treatment. But as testified, it was just a shared link. It was not a recommendation. And I don't think that there was any deception there. It wasn't um, a statement made that they referred them to there to, um, to say that it was a successful treatment. It was a link that was shared on the page. And I'll, and I'll just say that. And I, I do, and I have heard through, um, uh, others, and I, I believe, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Representative Gilchrist was a former um, employee of NARAL. So that is the group, the very group that has been advocating um, for this bill. And finally, I just want to mention, Rep Gilchrist did mention that many of the um, pregnancy centers weren't part of the coalition, but per um, some research I've done, the reason for that that I was given is that they have... Um, in their, I think, bylaws will not engage in anything political. And that is why they are not part of that coalition. Um, thank you for the time, um, Representative. Thank you, Representative. And I just wanna say that, uh, you know, over 30 years ago, I worked on over-the-counter products for a pharmaceutical company. Does that make me have a conflict of interest 30 years later? If there isn't some sort of statute of limitations on this concept of conflict, that we cannot unlive any of our past experiences and have an independent point of view, I would think that's a shame. And uh, I am concerned when people suggest conflicts that really probably can't be substantiated in the current circumstances. Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to respond to three of the points that were just raised. Um, the first having to do with the website that I referenced on uh, ABC Women's Center in Middletown's webpage where they referenced abortion reversal. The whole point again of this bill is that crisis pregnancy centers that are making pregnancy related services, um, that's what they're offering. They are offering pregnancy related services and they advertise on their website that they have information regarding pregnancy related services. And so to have information on their website that is 
dangerous, not a procedure that's approved by medical organizations is the very definition of this bill, it is deceptive. Second, I would just thank Mr. Chair. Um, I was proudly the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Connecticut. I'm a proud advocate in this state and now I'm a state representative. Um, and the final piece having to do with the coalition, um, I don't know if many um, of the crisis pregnancy centers aren't participating in the coalition. I know we heard from many who were, but I do believe that one crisis pregnancy center that is now run by the former executive director of the Hartford Crisis Pregnancy Center that we've heard so many problems about is in Norwich and they are not participating in that coalition. And it has been reported that they're not participating in that coalition because they are refusing to do a softer approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Kavros de Graaf. As a, thank you, Mr. Chair. As a newer member of this committee, I have gone back and read a lot of the testimony from before and obviously was uh, a participant in the, in the public hearing. Uh, I guess what I'm finding confusing is why there's so much upset over the language of this bill when it clearly is only addressing bad actors. You know, we received hundreds of emails about this bill specifically, but this bill deals with bad actors. If you're not a bad actor in this space, then this isn't going to harm women's choice in any way. Women will still have the option to go to these centers, to receive care at these centers. Um, regarding potential amendments, um, certainly, you know, this bill, at some of the things that we learned in the public hearing, this bill does not address, um, and perhaps because of the language of this bill, it shouldn't, but I would like to say that moving forward, I think we do need to think about addressing um, the piece regarding the transvaginal ultrasound. Um, I, I know I've been in conversation with folks that there is some sort of uh, misinterpretation of, you know, these are not the ultrasounds that happen over your belly. These are internal ultrasounds. I've spoken with several OBs, several nurse, uh, certified nurse midwives, and they have all said that no, a urine test is more than enough to confirm pregnancy. The fact that they're being performed um, at these locations without, uh, often without a doctor being present, we just heard all about, you know, the medical assistants and whether or not a doctor is there and whose responsibility it is. So I certainly think that if we're going to be talking about a working group and amendments, I hope that perhaps some of those issues will be addressed because that, that falls under deception to me. If you're saying you have to have an ultrasound when uh, the Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology says have as few of those as possible. So, uh, but again, I, I just think that the language of the bill really is going after bad actors. And if you're not a bad actor in this space, that's wonderful that you're there to care for women and potentially their, their future children. Um, you know, just don't be a bad actor and, and you won't have to worry about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. That is what government does. We try to take care, take, go after those bad actor folks. If there are no other comments, let's see whether or not we should have an informal working group. Let's see if we can get this out of committee. Uh, Madam Administrator, I believe we're ready for the vote. Thank we're going to have your cameras you. on. I'm sorry. Okay, please. I'm sorry, Madam Administrator. I just want to make sure they all have their cameras on. Senator Dorothy Abrams. Senator Darty Abrams votes yes. Representative Steinberg. Representative Steinberg votes yes. Senator Kushner. Senator Kushner votes yes. Representative Gilchrist. Representative Gilchrist votes yes. Senator Wong. Senator Tony Wong votes no. Senator Wong. Senator Tony Wong votes no. For some reason, I'm not seeing you on camera, sir. I'm sorry. We can see him. I, I will attest people, that he's there. Other people need to put themselves on mute, and then and then you should be able to see him. So if you're not on mute, make sure you're on mute. Thank you. I'll try it again. Senator Tony Huang says votes no. Thank you. Senator Summers. Senator Summers votes no. Representative Pettit. Representative Pettit votes no. Representative Arnone. Representative Arnone votes yes. Representative Berger Givalio. Representative Berger Givalio votes yes. Representative Betts. 
Representative Whitbetts votes no. Representative Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Representative Cook. Representative Dauphiné. Representative Dauphiné votes no. Representative D'Amico. Representative D'Amico votes yes. Representative Elliott. Representative Elliott votes yes. Representative Foster. Representative Foster votes yes. Representative Django. Representative Django votes no. Representative Green. Representative Green votes no. Senator Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Senator Kassler. Senator Kassler votes yes. Representative Cabros de Gras. Representative Cabros de Gras votes yes. Representative Kennedy. Representative Kennedy votes no. Representative Claritas Dietria. Representative Claritas Dietria votes no. Representative Lenahan. Representative Linehan votes yes. Representative McCarty. Representative McCarty votes no. Senator Moore. Senator Moore votes yes. Representative Parker. Representative Parker votes yes. Representative Ryan. Representative Ryan votes yes. Representative Scanlon. Representative Scanlon votes yes. Representative Scanlon. Representative Scanlon votes yes. Thank you. Representative Terziak. Representative Terziak votes yes. Representative Young. Representative Young votes yes. Representative Zupkis. Representative Zupkis votes no. You want to do any second rounds, Madam Administrator? Senator Anwar. Representative Cook. Thank you, Madam Administrator. Once again, we will hold the votes open, let's say until 11.30 this morning. This concludes the three items on today's agenda. I will remind members of the committee, we are next together this Friday, the 26th. I believe on the agenda is the aid and dying bell. So that'll go real swift. And uh, wanna thank you all for your uh, very thoughtful deliberations today on these challenging bills. And uh, we will stand recessed. Have a great day. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye, Beverly. Rebellion, if you want to vote on the SB 285? Sure would. I am a no. All right. Got it. Thank you. All set. All right. Take care. You too.
Unmute Representative Cook. Hi, my dear. Hi. All right, so do you wanna ask me them in order? Yes, please. So the first one was? Medical assistance to administer vaccine, Senate Bill 285. I'm a no. Representative Cook is a no. The second one is an act concerning various revisions to the Department of Developmental Services statutes. Yep, Representative Cook is, I'm a yes. And the third one is Senate Bill 835, an act concerning deceptive advertising practices of limited services pregnancy centers. Representative Cook is a no. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, Senator Hi. Anwar. Good Thank morning. you. The first bill is Senate Bill 285, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. Uh, Senator Anwar votes yes. The second bill is Senate Bill 416, an act concerning various revisions to the Department of Developmental Services statutes. Senator Anwar votes yes. The third bill is Senate Bill 835, an act concerning deceptive advertising practices of limited services pregnancy centers. Senator Anwar votes yes. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Lindsay? Yep. We're done, right? It's just, yep. yep. I'll leave it running. In case someone, Elliot missed the vote. Oh, I got it. He did it right, right after everyone logged off. I asked him, he got, we got him. Okay. He voted um, no. On the on the first bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did he come up on screen? Yes. Okay. You voted no, you said, right? Correct. 
Wow. Bye. Things pop up. I'll just I'll leave it running. Okay. Um. How how um. The next public hearing is the twenty sixth, and we're going to do one on the third. So I think I'll just focus on agency bills. So I'm gonna reach out to Bree and health strategy just to make sure that they, they're gonna to have to do two hearings because I don't have all their bills. Okay. All right, see you later. I'm going to go to um to Cheryl's class. Okay. I'm going to get started on the minutes, Lindsay. I'll okay. see you later. See you later. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to do last last uh last week's and get those over. <laughs> Bye, Lexi. Bye.